welcome very much. We appreciate all of you being here. I know, Judge Starak, and you took a train and got here, so we've switched you. Um, Thank let you. Me, yeah, you're welcome. Um, let me, uh, before we get started, let me just say briefly, I'm gonna interview, introduce all of you, uh, but I would appreciate it if you would make a very brief opening statement so we have time for questions. Um, I, those of you who've given us written submissions, uh, the, the committee has had opportunity to review those, so we don't really need to, and I know yours was a little late, but we appreciate it. Um, and so if you would just go, go ahead and give us a short, brief opening statement, and then we'll begin with questions questions from the questions from the committee um, we have here uh, judge I'm sorry J former ret retired judge Nancy Gertner from Harvard Law School um, we have Judge Leo Sorokin from the District of Massachusetts we have Magistrate Judge Cheryl Pollock from the Eastern District of New York and Chief Judge Nancy Torreson from Maine so if we want to go ahead and we'll get started just right in order uh, Judge Pollock all right, well, um, first of all, I want to thank, uh, thank you, Judge Cardone, and the committee uh, for the opportunity to appear today on behalf of the Eastern District of New York. Um, I've spent some time reviewing the submissions and prior testimony given at the earlier panels, and I applaud the important work that uh, the committee has undertaken here. I have also taken the time to discuss the concerns and various proposals for change with our Board of Judges. Our judges take very seriously that portion of the oath that we all took to do justice to the rich and the poor, and our court has worked very hard to create a program that ensures that we provide for our indigent defendants the highest caliber of defense attorneys available. Briefly, my background is that I uh, was a prosecutor for nine years uh, before becoming a magistrate judge in Brooklyn, where I've served for over 20 years now. Um, I've been a member of our court's CJA committee for 15 years, and for the past five years, I have served as the chair of that committee. Now, based on the discussions I had last week, with our board of judges, the general consensus, and I'm not speaking for every one of our judges, but the general sense was that the CJA program in the Eastern District of New York works very well. Not only have we been successful in attracting and keeping a panel of CJA attorneys who by and large surpass the quality and experience of the private bar, but the issue of voucher cutting to the extent that it occurs in our district is rare. The overwhelming sentiment of our court was that it would be a mistake that could adversely impact the quality of defense representation were there to be a complete overhaul of the program. To the extent that changes may be needed, and I concede that there are some, the sentiment was that minor changes within the existing system would fix whatever problems there are, at least with respect to the way the program works in our district. Indeed, I would urge the committee to consider certain aspects of our CJA program as a model for possible reforms that are more <laughs> practical than a complete legislative overhaul of the entire system. Our CJA committee, which consists of four judicial officers, three federal defenders and five criminal defense attorneys drawn from the panel and from the private bar is solely responsible for selecting the panel attorneys. Each year, one third of our panel comes up for review. And while we solicit input from the other judges, the decision to appoint is made by consensus of all committee members. The committee has also made a concerted effort to expand the diversity of our panel and to provide education and mentoring for new recruits because we view the issue of diversity as an extremely important one. In terms of voucher reductions, as I said before, they are extremely rare. Less than 5% of the vouchers are reduced according to the information that I received. And the vast majority of the adjustments have been made because lawyers can't do math. I mean, that's why we all became lawyers. Um, most of those adjustments are made not by the judges, but by the voucher processing clerk. And with few exceptions, the judges in our court routinely request 
uh, grant requests for investigators and other experts. I've been told that to the extent there is a concern about a voucher or a request, our case budgeting attorney, Jerry Tritz, who I think testified before this committee several months ago, has been extremely helpful in acting as an intermediary, negotiating a resolution between the judge and counsel. Um, the consensus is that this has worked quite well. The one sentiment that was shared by the majority of the judges was that it would be a mistake to take the judges out of the voucher review process altogether because they are the ones who review the attorney's written submissions and who observe the attorney's um, conduct in the courtroom. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not express to you the biggest concern that our judges raised with the proposal to remove the CJA program from the umbrella of the judiciary, and that is the issue of funding, which was, of course, discussed at the last panel. There is a widespread belief that an independent CJA program would face serious problems obtaining sufficient funding from Congress. Our Chief Judge Carol Ammon fought long and hard during the sequester to obtain additional funding for our federal defenders who were decimated by furloughs and budget cuts. To the extent that there has been expressed a fear that the judiciary does not appreciate the work of our federal defenders and CJA lawyers, my fear is that Congress, which is even further removed from observing the critical work that these fabulous attorneys do, will be even less understanding of the need for funding without our support. Um, thank you again, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Judge Gert. Thank you. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and to be with old friends, candidly. I think that that was part of the reason why I wanted to do this. Um, I come to this subject uh, with a very sort of diverse background, both a criminal defense lawyer and civil rights lawyer for 24 years and on the bench for 17. And now I am teaching and candidly sticking my toe in criminal defense work as well. And some of my observations then come from that experience. Um, it was said during the previous panel about the extraordinary changes in criminal prosecutions, but I don't think that you can emphasize that uh, enough. Even the ordinary drug sale on the corner has surveillance tapes, cell phone data, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's the, the distinction between the mega cases and the ordinary cases have become narrowed. Certainly the mega case may have substantially more uh, expert megabytes and terabytes, but even the ordinary case seems to have a substantial amount of that as well. So the, the US attorney comes to the table with substantial resources. I don't want to go over this point. Uh, and then once the indictment is brought, the US attorney determines how long to get to the indictment. Once the indictment is brought, the pressures of time begin, Speedy Trial Act pressures, which then, given the kind of complexity of federal criminal prosecution, makes resources all the more critical. The defense lawyer needs the resources precisely to deal with these kind of pressures. Something I didn't put in my remarks, but I thought about as we were sitting here is the bench has spent a great deal of time talking about the, the uh, e-discovery in connection with civil cases and the transaction costs that came about through e-discovery and the disproportionate resources. To some degree, I want to look at that in connection with criminal cases as well. The government comes to the table with so much more resources to deal with electronic data than the defense does, and yet the U.S. Attorney's Office is not reviewed in the same way as the defense is. So I think that that's an issue as well. I think all of this is through the lens of the continuation of extraordinary punishments. Um, you know, just extraordinary punishments on the federal side, 10, 15, 20 years, even life for drug offenses. But you all know that. And then something that was mentioned in an earlier panel, um, being a good defense lawyer, an effective defense lawyer today, is more than just knowing the cases and knowing the defenses. I did a little description in my remarks of the extraordinary cases that have come down from the Supreme Court, which speak to the importance of creative lawyering and not just knowing the case. Knowing the case, knowing where the, uh, the law is going, knowing what to preserve. 
I also noted that um, the First Circuit, for example, is one of the circuits that regularly dismisses arguments for not having been preserved. It has one of the highest bars uh, for this. In other words, a lawyer is chided, an argument that wasn't made below or not made adequately below or made as the last argument in a brief uh, is then considered waived. That puts a premium on a lawyer not just uh, doing the ordinary work, but making sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's um, are crossed. Um, when I look at the, 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 the guidance, the uh, guidelines for the CJA list, as I was sitting uh, in, the, in the audience, I thought that somehow what comes out of what I saw, and I'll go into that in a little detail, is the following message. It's as if we all know the case is gonna be a plea, we all know that the likelihood is that it will be a guideline sentence. Perhaps a guideline sentence is modified by what the government agreed to, so why bother? And some of the guidance that I saw from my former court seems to reflect that attitude. Um, I also indicated that since 97% of the federal docket are pleas of guilty, and I can speak personally to this, you get to the case at a time when you don't know what went into that bargain. You have simply no idea. Uh, and if you come to the job with no criminal law background at all, you have even uh, less of an idea. Um, I might add that uh, I have been struck since I left the bench with the extraordinary changes in the criminal practice just in the past 20 years. A practice that is faster paced, that is now extraordinary amounts of email. Uh, so the judges don't know what they don't know, which is what went into that uh, plea. Um, I, I just heard, just as an anecdote, of uh, a judge that uh, shut down a database which of, of, uh, uh, of information uh, in which all the defense lawyers could get, to which all the defense lawyers could get access because it was too costly to keep up. You could only get your portion of it rather than seeing the discovery that was offered to everyone else. Well, that makes a difference to the defense. That is to say, it makes a difference whether you see the whole or just your part of it. Um, I was concerned about, uh, as I noted in my, in my uh, remarks, I, I'm trying to sort of think through the, uh, what I saw as a sort of disproportionate racial impact on one of the guidelines, which I think uh, I'm not sure that the court understood. It says uh, 4.8 discourages seeking the services of a psychiatrist or a psychologist as a routine matter, limiting such testimony to instances where there's a genuine issue, quote, genuine issue of serious mental impairment that may have a material effect on matters of criminal responsibility. I paused when I saw that. Uh, for the most part, the vast majority of African American <coughs> Uh, defendants that I sentenced had disciplinary records 10th or 11th grade. I have no doubt that, this, at least I speculated, that the misconduct that got them uh, treated as disciplinary problems in their schools might have been the subject of a referral to a psychiatrist in middle class schools. And so the language of psychiatry, psychology, was just never brought to bear in these cases at all. They were discipline problems. Uh, I thought that the question of whether or not someone had a serious mental impairment required examination, not something that you uh, could assume before you uh, inquired any further. And I was concerned about that and, other, and the provision of other experts in a post-Booker world. This is really taking a page from uh, Judge Restrepo's comments. The enterprise post-Booker was to individualize. Uh, you can't individualize. Psychiatrists and experts are not something that the probation department would know about. You can't individualize unless you have the information with which to individualize. So this was a, this was a guideline that was going to discourage precisely the kinds of experts that I thought was needed. One of the other things I didn't note in my remarks was uh, on the subject of you don't know what you don't know. I recall taking a plea and sentencing a woman. And I began to read the pre-sentence report with the strongest sense that, in fact, she had been beaten by the man for whom she was working. 
and that there was a battered woman syndrome issue here. I didn't know, and I inquired at sentencing to see if anyone had ever examined that. The lawyer made it clear that he hadn't examined that because he feared that if he did, first he wouldn't get the funds for it, but in addition he would lose acceptance of responsibility points for uh, vigorously going after this. Um, I uh, paused, uh, asked for this examination to take place, asked for the lawyer if you thought that the examination <coughs> was appropriate, and it turned out that in fact she had been beaten and it was a reasonable thing to look at. Um, I'm not sure where I come out, and perhaps I'm too far from the uh, nuts and bolts of the administration of the CJA Act to speak to this, but um, I understand the importance of training, but correct me if I'm wrong, <coughs> apart from baby judge school, the training programs are not mandated. And what I've seen, I remember taking law and neuroscience training, which I now teach, um, but the judges who go to the training are those who are already interested. And so I'm not sure that training is the way to solve the issues here. Um, I think that the, I appreciate the concerns about the risks of an independent agency outside of the rubric of the judiciary, but it does seem to me that some kind of expertise, non-judicial expertise, has to be brought to bear here, a panel of experts on these cases that would recommend to the, to the bench. Uh, I'm not sure that would remain within the judiciary. And then I know that Miriam Conrad of our district is considering um, or has already proposed some kind of algorithm, a presumptive relationship between the expenditures of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the expenditures of the, uh, of the defenders. Um, there were many wonderful defenders when I was on the bench but I saw some troubling defense work uh, as well. And during the time of, that I was on the bench, the very best lawyers, unlike Judge Pollack's experience, left the list, did not want to stay on the list, which was of concern. Thank you. Judge Torres. Good afternoon. I know it's late in the day, and I'll, I'll try to keep my opening remarks brief. First, I want to thank you, Judge Cardone, for the invitation to um, give you some feedback on the CJA program, and I want to thank the whole committee for all of the work you're doing. I realize this is a lot of time out of your normal duties, and it's, it's, uh, it's a good cause. Um, just to give you some background on myself, I've only been a judge for four and a half years, which is enough in Maine to make you the chief, so um, <laughs> I don't know what's, what that means, but uh, prior to becoming a judge, I was an assistant U.S. attorney um, <coughs> in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Bangor, Maine for 21 years. Um, so I've seen our CJA panel kind of grow over the years. Um, I've seen the addition of the Federal Defender's Office in 2005 when that first opened in Maine. And I've worked with almost every member of the CJ panel in Maine and, um, and all the federal defenders in one capacity or another. Um, I have to say that in, in Maine, the system by and large works. Um, we have excellent representation from our CJ panel attorneys and uh, we have a, a really fantastic federal defender's office um, headed by federal defender David Benneman who is um, really a great leader for that office as well as for the panel um, attorneys. And um, I observed um, some of the comments at lunchtime and one judge made the comment that, you know, one size doesn't fit all and I think that's kind of um, something that I see here. We're a very um, large state geographically but a small state population wise and um, we have a very small federal defender's office, only three federal defenders and a 54 member panel. And we've kind of reached that balance um, and it seems to work pretty well for us. It allows the uh, individual panel members to each get around three to five cases a year, which allows them to keep their skills up. And, um, and so the, the federal defender's office is deliberately that kept itself kind of small. I guess they could hire additional attorneys, but they don't so that we can keep that all in balance. Um, 
I don't want to go on too much. I will. Um, I, I liked the exchange when you asked questions, so I think I'll. I think I'll pause there and just uh, kick it over to uh, Judge Sorokin. So uh, you may regret that statement with the question <laughs> and answer period. Hey, Judge Sorokin. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for um, both having me and accommodating um, the, my delay, and also not only for the work you've done, but for the work I expect or anticipate you're probably going to have to do. Uh, to finish this process, so I thank you for that. I'll be I'll be really brief. Um, uh, I've been a district judge not quite two years. I was a magistrate judge before that for eight or nine years, and before that I was in the Federal Public Defender Office for eight years in Boston. Um, I did a few other things before that, but they're probably not as relevant um, to what you're doing. Uh, I would um, say just a couple quick points. One is I think generally the system in, that we have, in, at least for our district, works well. We have a superb federal defender office. Um, I think that um, they do really a great job, and they're very helpful, as I explained in the comments, in terms of training for the CJ, CJA panel. We have a good panel. I think some of the lawyers on the panel are superb, and some aren't superb. Um, uh, we have a, a reasonably effective system, I think, of trying to sort of review that, but that's a process that we're trying to figure out how to do better at in terms of getting more timely and better feedback about how people are doing when there's a when there, when there are issues. One of the tensions always is that um, the panel now we have is about 100 lawyers, which gives them about two to three cases per year, given how we've sort of equitably allocated the cases. Um, but we need a relatively large panel because sometimes we get either a big, we just had a 58 defendant indictment. So we need 58, 57 lawyers beyond the federal defender. You need a larger panel to accommodate that. We don't, that's a pretty big case for our district, but it's not unusual to see an investigation that leads to 30 defendants, say, and essentially everybody's conflicted from all the other defendants, whether they're in one or several indictments. So there's a certain tension in managing that I just highlight. If I leave you with three points, to think about, they'd be these. One, I think you should focus on quality. I think in the federal system, we're very focused often on measurements that reflect how fast we can do things or how efficiently we can do things, but we rarely have metrics that look at how well we're doing things. And really, this is something where it, what matters is how well the defendant is represented. There's nothing that more unsettling than sitting in a courtroom and watching somebody represented by someone who seems deficient. And that was unsettling when I was a lawyer. It was unsettling at a detention hearing as a magistrate judge, and it's very unsettling as a district judge. I'm pleased to say, by and large, I don't see that. Sometimes where I do see it is in appointed. I'm not in retained cases, actually. But um, that there's often little, there's less you can do about that. But that's the issue, I think, and quality is really important. And I think quality is particularly important going forward because we're seeing two massive changes in criminal law that affect how people practice, that are going to affect the, how people practice law. One is the sea change with electronic evidence. I'm um, mostly on, in terms of my experience as a practicing lawyer on the other side of it. I didn't see a lot of it um, as a lawyer. But everything is coming electronically now, and the amount of data has vastly expanded, and the way you need to process and think about it is starting to change. If you have hundreds of hours of poll camera data, you're not realistically going to be able to sit there and watch it all. But on the other hand, you need to be able to figure out ways to access that, whether it's by looking at reports or whether it's by finding electronic tools that will search that data to help you find what you want. So finding people who are equipped to do that, but also I think what that means is our model of the solo practitioner who practices criminal law and sort of has skills from law school and skills from trial experience and can show up and try cases is not as, as perfect a model as it once was because you need these, to, to handle these kinds of cases with that kind of information, you need different kind of resources. The defenders, by and large, it seems, have those resources, I think, but we need to figure out a way to deliver those resources to individual CJ lawyers or the lawyers who are on the panel because they're as solo practitioners, not going to be able to do it. And at least in Boston, there are some big firm lawyers who are on the panels. But it's functionally for them a pro bono activity at $125 an hour. Um, and they may do it, and that's fine, but we're not, going to get, we're, not, we're not going to get huge numbers there. The second sea change, I think, is that there's the, the system more and more is focusing on um, uh, viewing people and viewing the response to convictions as more than just sending people to jail. Sometimes it's not sending people to jail. When it is sending people to jail, it's not just sending them to jail. 
And I think that we're understanding that the system is changing to see that there's, rather than there's two boxes uh, that are divided, one is sort of people who aren't in the system because they're not guilty and those who are in the system and those who are in the system go to jail for long periods of time and that's that. That there's a lot of responses to these problems and that we're going to see that there's drug treatment, there's, um, uh, there's a variety of, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, front end programs that have begun in different districts and um, there are a variety of different initiatives that have developed over the last 10 years in the federal system that require somewhat different lawyering skills and bring up different kinds of issues. And so I think that that's why I come back to say quality is really significant and I would ask that you really focus on that. I don't think that's necessarily, I'm not saying that as an indictment of what we have, because it's not. But it's that you are writing the report for the next 20 years. And so you need, to, you need the blueprint, not just for what should happen this year and next year, but you need to think long term in terms of the kinds of, as best you can foresee the future, as the kind of changes that are happening now and how to equip the system in that way. Second um, thought I'd leave you with is that I think you should hear from um, uh, people who've been represented. I think that um, too often we have the surgical model, right? The old days, surgeons, did, they didn't talk to the patients, and they, they, surgeons knew what the patients required, they did it. And the lawyers talk in our system to the um, patients in our analogy, in our system, that's the defendants. But I think that, I don't say that that their prescription for how to adjust the system is the blueprint, but I think that they would have uh, useful insights and would give you different perspectives on all sorts of practical issues from how often they're visited in jail, whether that's really helpful. Uh, looking at electronic evidence, it has to be, and I hear it a little bit, that electronic evidence is a lot harder to see in pretrial detention facilities. And so they would have a useful perspective, on it, as would the defense lawyers you're hearing from. But So I would urge you to, um, hear from them as best you're able. And with that, I'll stop talking. And I do want to tell you, Judge Sorocco, we have heard from defendants, um, particularly in the Portland, Oregon hearing. Mm -hmm. um, right. but, uh, and, uh, but we um, do hear what you're saying. Okay, let's start with Judge Walt. Um, <clears throat> Judge Pollock, you said that you don't have a problem with uh, lawyers leaving the panel, uh, which is intriguing considering the cost of living. Uh, in New York, and uh, what are your feelings about whether there is a sufficient uh, uh, amount of money being paid per, per hour for uh, legal, representation, legal representation of poor people, and is it enough in New York? Well, I, I would say that it is not enough, uh, that the rates clearly are too low uh, given the cost of living in New York. Um, I think that Part of the reason we have been so successful in keeping lawyers, and I'm, I'm not saying we haven't lost any, but we, we have been very successful in keeping the top-notch lawyers because I think they're dedicated to this work. Um, and they don't do this uh, solely to make a living. Uh, they do this because they are passionate about the representation that they give to these criminal defendants. Um, and I think that service on our CJA panel is viewed as an honor. Um, it's, you know, reappointment is not guaranteed. Uh, people are rotated off every year um, in order to give an opportunity for younger uh, new lawyers to get their feet wet and to learn the system. Um, and so I think, you know, they value, they value service on our panel. Judge Gertner, you said your experience was somewhat different. Uh, over the, w one of the innovations of our CJA panel when I was on the bench was that it really had the very, very top of the profession on it. I mean, lawyers who, you know, one day would be front pages of the newspapers defending some well-heeled defendant who was also on the panel, and it was quite extraordinary. My understanding is that that has changed. Most of those people are off. I wonder, and I just speculate about this, whether part of it is that the Eastern District did not have a culture of cutting vouchers, and that to some degree more of that happened in the District of Massachusetts. And when you select a lawyer who you know, is a, a, a competent lawyer, there is, uh, forgive me, an element of sort of disrespect in 
uh, second guessing to this degree. So my, what I understand is that the, some of the best and the brightest have, have left the list. So there's a relationship between who you get and how you treat people. And uh, just Pollock, you also said that you thought the system should not be significantly changed, but there were some changes that were needed. What, what changes do you think are needed? I, I guess my major concern is to the extent that there is voucher cutting that is done in our district. It's limited to one or two or perhaps three off judicial officers. And, you know, Judge Gleason years ago, um, He's no longer with us, unfortunately. He's no longer sitting on the bench. He's with us. <laughs> He's, with us. Yeah. He's no longer sitting on the bench for He's for me, it's the big same bucks. thing. Right. Retirement does not mean death. I just want to make this clear. <laughs> to me, it does. <laughs> but um, you know, he pushed very hard for um, a a provision in the in the plan to require some sort of opportunity to be heard. Um, when there was voucher cutting. And, you know, I've heard and listened to these panels where the judges don't pay any attention to what's in the plan. They don't pay attention to the prescription that they need to give an opportunity to the lawyer whose voucher is being cut to explain why um, he thinks it shouldn't be cut. And so, to, to the extent that I think there needs to be a change, we need to come up with a system to systematize that review process, that opportunity to be heard. And to the extent that, you know, we're dealing with Article Three judges who, with all due respect, don't like to be told what to do. Um, a, a committee suggesting that the voucher is fine is going to work for some, but not for others. So I, I don't really know what the answer is. I know that there have been occasions where lawyers have come to me and said, my voucher was cut or an investigator was denied, and I've gone to the judge. And he said, well, I thought it was appropriate, and that was it. There was nothing. There was nothing more that I could do, um, apart from politely arguing with him, to persuade him that he was wrong. So that's where I see a potential issue that could perhaps be dealt with in a better way than we deal with it now. Judge uh, Torrenson and Judge uh, Sorokin, you both said that in your districts, lawyers, panel lawyers, receive maybe two to three. Uh, appointments in a year. Do you think that's a sufficient number of cases to, to stay proficient? We've, uh, uh, we have a um, CJA selection panel with a number of mem members of the panel on it, and um, that's the number. Ours is three to five um, that they've kind of settled on as the, the minimum would be three because um, they do have to do the training and, and just stay on top of the guideline changes. There's a lot of work to sort of keeping up to speed, um, but that's sort of the magic number for us. And it, a lot depends of on what the U.S. Attorney's Office bring in a particular year, too. So, And so what type of other work? Are, are they doing criminal work? Yeah, most of our work? CJA panel also do retained CJA work, um, and they do some state work. So, I think it depends, to be honest. Um, I think if you have a lawyer who uh, has a criminal practice and includes a federal practice, then they're probably already up to speed and only receiving two or three cases a year is enough. On the other hand, if you have a lawyer whose entire practice has been in state criminal courts and now is coming to the federal court, which has, at least in Massachusetts, a whole different set of rules and a different culture and a different approach and requires a different way of practicing, there's much more, there's a lot more writing, at least in our federal court than our um, state, state courts in Massachusetts. Two or three is a little bit hard. If you have a lawyer who's committed and they go to the trainings. We have a training for all new panel members that's required, and we've recently required yearly training for everyone on the panel. They go to those things. It can be enough, but um, I mean, I think the, the tension is more cases would be better. I think that's one reason the federal defenders are better. Um, but the problem is we need some number of lawyers because when we get the bigger cases, we don't have enough lawyers for everybody. If we, the, the federal defenders can't represent everyone. Um, I do think that's one of the reasons why um, in, in culturally encouraging lawyers 
to talk to each other and reach out. So at least, and uh, maybe this is my own deficiencies, but as a lawyer and as a magistrate judge, as a district judge, I regularly talk to uh, my colleagues about what I'm doing and what kind of issues are presented. It's a little bit harder, I think, you know, near the defender's office, you can walk down the hall, you can talk to other people, and there's a wealth of experience right there to draw upon. At least in our district, the defenders will answer any question from any CJA lawyer at any time. But the CJA lawyers, need, you need to foster a culture that will um, encourage those phone calls um, and make people feel um, that that's welcome. Did I correctly hear you say that the, uh, as far as quality of representation is concerned, that the lesser quality have been in cases where lawyers were retained? I, it, honestly, that's my view. I, there are some, and let me, I'll explain. There are some retained lawyers who are as good as any lawyer in the city, and when I see those people in those cases, they do a great job. But I have seen retained lawyers in cases who have never been in federal court before. They represented the defendant when it was a state case. Now the case got federalized, but it's a different kind of case now, maybe a different charge, even though it arose out of the same incident. And they're, they're just out of their leak, and they're, they're not well representing the person, and the person's poorly represented, and, but the, you know, they have a fee and whatever they, I don't know what the arrangements are. And so there are cases I see like that, and in and, and, and my view, the, some of the uh, lowest quality representation I've seen is in that scenario. And we've heard some people say, well, people who are getting court-appointed lawyers, uh, they're only entitled to a Chevy. They're not entitled to a Cadillac. I don't think that's a good analogy. If I were in trouble, I want a Maserati. Uh, <laughs> but in any event, a Hummer if I the mean, government I mean, were coming <laughs> after me. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, I, some may use that to say, well, if if uh, what you know, if the worst representation is being provided by uh, counsel who's retained, why should we be concerned about putting more money into the system for uh, people who are appointed? Well, even appointed counsel. I think I would say that first, the first answer to that is that the constitutional standard is not the, the worst quality of lawyering that's possible. Um, that, isn't the, the, that isn't what we aspire to. That isn't the standard. And those cases, frankly, cause us all sorts of other problems that aren't, that aren't things as a system we necessarily want. We may be constrained and not be able to do something about it. But it doesn't mean the ineffective assistance claim isn't coming later that we have to deal with and all of the collateral consequences. The second is... I think that, that it says something, first it says something about our society, about what kind of representation we afford to people who are, are we're talking about putting in jail. And one of the things, you know, I imagine when we've gone to other countries to spread the word, they already had judges and prosecutors, but they didn't have real defense attorneys. And so real defense attorneys mean something, and it says something about what, the way we're going to treat everybody in our society. So. I mean, it's a little bit hard to make the automobile analogy, um, but it seems to me that every, we should be providing very good defense to everybody when it's somebody who can't afford it. And um, I think the second part of it is what it, what it does is, um, and this is why I find Miriam Conrad's sort of algorithm proposal interesting, wherever you locate the, um, uh, the defender function, is that it is, in a way, a cost of the government bringing the case, is the defense. And, and as the system becomes, not only you have more electronic evidence, but you have more forensic evidence, those are more complicated things to challenge. And the risk, we had a situation in Massachusetts in state court, but it, it infected federal cases, where there was a woman who worked at the, a, a lab analyst who worked at the crime lab where they tested drugs. She was falsifying documents. She was injecting, she was a contam intentionally contaminating substances. So she'd get a sample and she would put cocaine into the sample. She was skipping over tests and they had, they had a check procedure in some fashion. And they had some reviews. And nonetheless, it went on for a long time. It affected like, I don't know, maybe Nancy would remember, but I don't know if it was 10,000 or 40,000 cases. It's still affecting cases. And right. it's still affecting right. cases. And so having a, a, a robust defense function is really a critical part of responding to problems. And so when you think about what quality, um, I think about the medical world where you could look at that problem we had in Massachusetts and say, well, that was one bad apple, right? It was you know, one person, that person, she's been prosecuted, she's in jail, problem over. But 
you know, in a hospital, they wouldn't view that as one bad doctor or one bad nurse. They would step back and they would look at the system and they'd say there's a problem with the system. The problem with that person, deal with that person, but there are system problems as well and you would try to adjust the system. So part of the way that we secure against those problems is having meaningful and robust defense function. So we're providing the first the, a quality defense for that defendant, but we're also providing it because it's part of the, I mean, the defense attorney who found that problem or, or whoever found that problem in that scenario in Massachusetts, they were benefiting a lot of people beyond the individual case that came up in. So I think it serves a lot of functions. I think it's important. That said, it's public money, and we should use it wisely. I don't want to pit you against your colleagues, but Judge Gertner said that there has been, at least in the past, a problem with voucher cutting uh, in Massachusetts. Is that still uh, a so problem? So I don't. Uh, it's not a problem. In from my pers from what I understand, it's not a problem now. I talked to the new head of the CJA panel, uh, uh, CJA board. We have a board, and I asked her about that. No, this is. She took over in November. It's more recent, recent news. And, and she said she doesn't see it as a present problem. I think part of the problem, and I can't speak to what um, uh, Nancy was talking about, particularly because as a magistrate judge, I was on the court. I didn't review vouchers in our district, only the district judges do. Um, but I do think there's a, a little bit, it may be, have been a problem. I don't know. But it may also be the restaurant phenomenon. In other words, the, the criminal bar is a very small community. So if you go to a restaurant, you have a bad experience one day, you tell people about it, that can be the death of that restaurant, even though that might have just been a, literally a bad day for them. Um, I think what happens is if there's one voucher, when you have one or two vouchers cut, that can also ripple. I'm not saying there aren't problems in other districts, and there may have been problems in our district, or there may be individual judges who are doing it. I don't really have information to uh, sort of a base to say yes or no on that. I haven't seen it. I do, if you want, uh, I'll stop if you want, but I do, th I mean, I would think there's, people are better situated than judges to review the vouchers, but that's a different question. Just, I think, um, I think the restaurant analogy is a very good analogy. One of the things that I do is I lurk on the CJA listserv. Uh, so I have a sense of the complaints. I'm, they allowed me to lurk. I'm a, I, I do a little bit more than lurking, but uh, there's no question then that there, it, it's hard to know what the scope is, but there are certainly some celebrated cases. The voucher that was cut, as I wrote it, for excessive research. Um, the the uh, the voucher that was uh, cut because of the uh, because of the psychologist, etc. Particular judges have developed a reputation for doing more voucher cutting. So I I mean I. I don't know whether or not what the scope is, but certainly the, the, the noise on this listserv is that it happens a lot. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm not sure. But it may well be, as, as Leo is saying, it could be one or two <coughs> celebrated cases. I think you're going to have some people who are testifying before you, in fact, in one case where the lawyer moved to disqualify the judge because he sought um, uh, partial payments. The judge denied it. Uh, and he wrote a motion to disqualify the judge for not essentially uh, taking into account what the difficulty of the defense was. I don't know the legitimacy of that. I only know that it happened. Thank you. Judge Prado? Just to follow up on, on what I think you said, that, that maybe voucher review should be done by someone else other than, than, than judges. Do, do the rest of you think that it should stay with the judges, that it's part of our responsibility to review the vouchers and we're in the best position to see it because we're the judge there? Or does it put us in a conflict situation because we're dictating what the defense is going to be, how broad it's going to be, or how narrow it's going to be depending on, on what we allow? And each one of us is different, so you're going to have inconsistencies. But you know, you have a situation where maybe some people say, judges say we're in the best position to evaluate it because we're, we know the case, we know what's going on. Others say it puts us in a conflict situation because we're dictating to the defense uh, how they're going to prepare for their case. So I'm just wondering, you think it's, it's best to stay with us or do you think it should go to someone else? And if it should go to someone else, who would be the lucky person to be reviewing vouchers? Well, the sentiment of 
the judges on my court was that they should continue to play a role in it. Um, I think that there was also a sentiment that the case budgeting attorney who in our district goes beyond just sitting down and helping attorneys budget for the mega cases, but uh, also volunteers or is commandeered, if you will, to assist when there is a question. Um, the judges, by and large, take what he has to say to heart. And if he tells them this is a reasonable expense, by and large, they go along with it. Um, and when there are issues, um, what he told me is often if the judges raise something with him, he generally agrees with them, and then he goes and negotiates uh, with the lawyer to fix the, uh, the voucher so that it is, they take out whatever is, is a problem. Um, but, you know, I, I know there have been a lot of discussion about taking it out of the judiciary completely. Um, I do think that judges have a role to play because they do see what goes on in the courtroom. Um, and they do <coughs> review with great care, you know, the, the 25 page brief that was cut and pasted from another case, very clear because the defendant's name is wrong. Um, and, and the, you know, the lawyer has billed, you know, 40 hours to prepare this, this cut and paste job. Uh, you know, I don't know that a, an independent person would take the time to read it. The judge obviously has to. So that would be what I would say in response to that question. I, I don't, I, I would almost want to ask the judges on the panel whether or not they feel that they understand what has gone on in a case that pleads guilty. Numbers of times, someone, I would hear nothing about the case. I'd know nothing about the case until I'd hear that there was a plea. <coughs> Uh, and what you don't know, you don't know the charges dropped, you don't know the evidence that the lawyer developed and uh, got the government to, to go in the direction that they went. Um, so something that is litigated is one thing, but in a case which was so many of the cases that I saw where issues were not specifically litigated, I'm not sure that I knew, and I had been a criminal defense lawyer, I knew what had gone into it. There may be an audit function. As I indicated, I was on the Committee for Public Counsel Services before I was a judge. And there's certainly an audit function that, it, that someone within the judiciary could have, making sure that not someone isn't billing 9 million hours for a day, um, where something is filed, taking a look at it. Um, but I see the advantage of having at least an independent en entity within the judiciary, understanding the risks of having it outside the judiciary, of people with expertise in uh, criminal defense work, who would uh, who'd be able to ask the questions about what went on that you actually didn't see in court. I uh, polled the judges in, well, actually I started an email, and uh, I got the response from the first judge was we should See, have them set up a defender general's office, just like the attorney general's office, and let them um, manage the whole thing. And then um, the response to that was uh, two, two responses. One was, you know, I think we're in a better position to determine what has happened than most people um, that would be reviewing these uh, vouchers. And then the um, other thing that I thought was interesting, and it's been mentioned here today, um, is that is the judiciary really the better uh, body to ensure Sixth Amendment compliance? Is, is it, are we in the best position really, to, and are we the ones that care about it more than it might be cared about uh, in the you know, executive branch or anything other than that? So that, it was the same kind of debate in my, among my judges as I've heard all day today. I think with respect to the vouchers, separate from whether the defense function should be within or outside the AO or the judges, I think it's probably better if it's somebody other than the judges for a couple of reasons. One is if, if you centralize the function, people see across the board. I only see my 1 11th of the cases in Boston, the vouchers, but if there's a more centralized function, you're seeing all of the cases. And since this is a, essentially an audit kind of function, 
you're going to be in a better position to evaluate cases and the amount of time spent, especially when a lot of the time is spent in things that we don't see in the courtroom and may not necessarily be reflected in pleadings that we can evaluate. Um, I also think there's a difference up front when you're reviewing sort of the, the conflict is heightened when the case is going along and someone's come to you, will you approve this or not? And we have a model for how it's done where we don't have that conflict, which is the defenders. And the defenders approve their own expert uh, determination, so they already have to make those judgments. They're making judgments about, we have a budget, how do we do it, how do we spend it, is it worth it in the case or not, does it make sense? So there's a way to do it, and it seems to me it presents a nicer model than having us sit on that as the case is going forward um, and making those judgments about it. Um, and I do think there's a role to play for judges because uh, um, in that example, for example, the 25-page cut and paste is a lot different than the really thoughtful memo addressing a complicated issue of law that they might have lost on or they might have won on, but re reflected a lot of work that was well done and properly done. Um, so I, um, I'd be inclined to say, given the conflict, um, I would move it to someone other than the judges. I, I can't say that that's a consensus representation of our court. I know there are a number of judges on our court who feel the conflict and think there is a conflict, and as a result, it should move away from the judges. Um, at least to some degree, but we didn't really take a vote on it and, um, or anything like that, so I, I wouldn't want to represent that as the views of the entire court. Uh, the other issue that, that as I listened to y'all came to mind is with so many cases now pleading guilty uh, and the lawyers, panel lawyers coming in only a few times a year, how do we go about evaluating the, the quality of representation? Uh, Ms. Gertner, I don't know, Judge, Honorable, it has H-O-N, Hun. Uh, I don't know if you lost that when you got no, off no, the no, bench. Do you, you still keep the Hun? You keep it forever, just okay. as long as you say retired afterwards. She pointed out the, the woman that had the, the, the uh, battered woman syndrome that the lawyer overlooked. How do we as judges know that the lawyer has done an adequate job of, of evaluating the case and doing an adequate evaluation when it just looks like we're a guilty plea factory and everybody's pleading guilty and we really don't know if that lawyer's done a good job. We're happy because we're not going to be sitting in the courtroom for a week trying the case and he's a good lawyer because he got his client to plead guilty. I'm Yeah, joking. No, I understand what you're but, saying. But how do we know if that lawyer's doing a good job or not when they plead guilty, most of their clients, and we really don't know if they've done a proper uh, investigation of the case. I think it's hard to answer that question. It's hard to know that in that circumstance. Sometimes you'll know it if you got the voucher and it said 45 minutes of time <laughs> in, in no investigation, but that's oh, you've already sentenced the person by that time. Um, sometimes you can draw upon clues from what you know. Maybe the case went from here to much narrower, and you can. Um, maybe draw the conclusion that the lawyer, you know, accomplished something in the course, and that might be some evidence of, of solid work. Um, sometimes it might be in little details. In a child pornography case, it might be that the, the lawyer is raising the issue that, well, the no contact with children, but the defendant has a child who will still be a minor when he gets out of prison, and that condition should be modified in some respects with respect to the child. So then it says, well, that's a person paying attention to the details, and it gives you a clue that you can draw the inference maybe they are, but I think that's a problem, and that's to some extent why, um, the at least in our district, we rely on the CJA board to evaluate. We give judicial feedback. We rely on the CJA board to make recommendations to us as who should stay and who not to try to get the um, criminal defense bar to weigh in on that. Well, don't, don't we actually send sort of the opposite message when we see guilty pleas and we say, couldn't have taken that much time. I mean, why did you spend so much time on a case that resulted in a guilty plea? Um, I, I mean, I, the concern is that we hear a lot of CJA panel attorneys say we put a lot of work in it to get to the guilty plea, but the judge doesn't see any of that. And how could a judge ever know that? I mean, we hear repeatedly, we're the best judge, we did this case, but they didn't do any of that. And you, is your question, how would we know that they did all that? Yes. I think it would be hard to know that. And I think that's a problem. In terms of a value, I mean, if you're evaluating the voucher and say, well, why are these 100 hours here? All you did was come in and plead your client, but maybe that 100 hours accomplished a whole lot that we just didn't see in the course of the plea in the courtroom. 
Great. I, I just wanted to say, I don't know if other districts do this or not, but we do in, in the District of Maine, at least most of the judges have a pre-sentence conference before a sentence, and I mean days before a sentence or weeks before a sentence. And it's a in chambers, around the conference table kind of a, a, a chance to talk through the issues that are going to be coming up and that and you get a, a sense of what the case is about. And it's also a, a really an opportunity for the defense counsel to sort of make those points if there are some. But um, I think that's one way of getting to know a case a little bit better and, and getting to know what the defender is or the uh, panel attorney has done in a particular case. I mean, again, we may never know. I mean, if uh, somebody's representing a real problem client and they have to spend an ignore, you know, tremendous amount of time, uh, you know, trying to get the confidence of that client and the other things you have to do when you have a difficult client, I mean, and, and the lawyer's not going to, he's probably going to be ineffective if he tells you or she tells you, this is why it costs so much. Well, so, a lot of time those little details do come out in that conference that, but you it, know, that. But sh probably shouldn't, though, should maybe it? Maybe not, but I've. I don't think that hurts them, but I, I, I think that you get a sense of it, you know, not maybe not in so many words, but you get a sense. All right. So, Professor Kerr. So, so first, thank you all for, for some particularly strong testimony, both in written and oral form. It's been very helpful. Um, broadly speaking, the issues that we're trying to answer for each uh, part uh, really boils down to two different questions. First, who has the power? To make the decision, and then what is the standard or process for making the decision? Uh, and Judge, Judge Prado just asked the important who should have the power questions. Um, and, and my own impression from your testimony and from testimony we've had on prior panels is this there's just uncertainty. There's no one correct answer that seems to emerge from that, with each, each question maybe having its pros and cons of judges versus alternatives. Um, uh, so, so I want to focus instead on the question of what the standard or process should be. Uh, uh, Judge Pollack, you had mentioned uh, that Judge Gleason in the uh, Eastern District Plan had ensured that there's a process for voucher cutting, for example. I think it was that each uh, judge should explain the process or the reason for the voucher cutting and have some sort of procedure by which a CJA lawyer can, can seek review of that. That's, that's one example of kind of a concrete process change that we could say this is a way of improving the system even if only in some incremental way. And I, I want to uh, open up to, to all four of you. Are there other processes that you think or standards that the, that the rules should adopt that would make for some sort of marginal improvement, even if just a small one, given the difficult balancing of, of interest and the, the nature of you know, wanting to have oversight, but not too much oversight, or you know, rules versus standards are always going to be complicated trade-offs. But are there other concrete ways in which you think here's a change in terms of, for example, who reviews uh, a a a, um, a decision, or um, uh, you know, it, should it just be left to the discretion of the judge in terms of whether a particular uh, uh, mar uh, 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 time is deemed reasonable? Versus should there be more rules in terms of presumptions maybe that a certain amount of time is deemed reasonable up to a certain threshold? Or Clearly there's some of that found in the current framework, but are there changes to that that would improve the system that we can, that we can basically grab your idea and put that into our report in a concrete way? Well, I thought a little bit about what, what a standard would be. And um, I think the problem is that as has been pointed out here. Every case is different. So a, a presumptive number of hours for speaking to your client, for example, would, would be impossible. Because as Judge Walton indicated, some clients are difficult. They take a lot longer to, to prepare, to talk to. You need more visits to MDC. Y you know, I, I just think, um, the best we've done is reasonable. What's reasonable? And that's the problem. Um, I do think that some sort of review process where the attorney feels that the judge has been unreasonable it is warranted. And what exactly that is, I, I don't know. I mean, I will say this. There's some irony to the fact that the judge in our district who tends to cut vouchers <coughs> more frequently than not is 
a former criminal defense attorney. So, you know, the argument that criminal defense attorneys know better um, than judges who haven't been criminal defense attorneys falls flat on my example. So I don't, I don't really have any suggestions to you as to what kind of presumptive standards we could set. Um, I, I'm not sure it would work in, you know, I mean, we have so many different cases. You know, we have, a, we have terrorist cases that, you know, go on for months and months. What, what's presumptively reasonable there? Tomorrow, I think you're going to hear from um, Miriam Conrad, who's in the audience now, who at least we, when we all spoke, talked about coming up with a system, I don't know how difficult this would be, to pitch the, at least as a target amount for the defender, a comparison with the prosecutor. Now, there are real issues about finding out what the prosecutor spent on X case. But clearly, if you have a case in which there are multiple prosecutors and multiple FBI agents involved, uh, if there's some kind of algorithm we could come up with so that the defender's resources would match or be a function of what the prosecutor's resources are. Because I think that's really the core uh, of the problem here. In a simple case that the prosecutor brings, uh, while you know the, the, the defense lawyer may do a considerable amount of work, that's one issue, uh, but the more the more serious problem that I think people confront is when the government has done a huge amount of work as they have a right to do and the defense is playing catch up and the judge doesn't see what that takes. So if there's some kind of way of coming up with an algorithm, that would be interesting. I, I think of the, um, the, the teacher that punishes the whole class because there's one or two misbehaviors. And I think that um, it might make sense and, and I may Maybe this would work more in a district the size of Maine than in some of the bigger districts, but it might make sense that if you have some mis misbehaviors, to go and educate them and tell them why it's not appropriate to, and I know there are Article Three judges, I understand that, but you know, make your efforts there. Because um, in Maine, we had 3% um, of the vouchers were cut last year, and that amounts to four to five vouchers four and a half vouchers, so um, it, it doesn't seem like it's a big problem. And, um, and it seems to me that the judges in Maine are pretty well situated to understand what the case is about, and oftentimes we can see what the prosecutor has spent. Um, not, you know, in any detailed way, but I know when a, in, I'm in trial and the prosecutor's agent is referring to report number 457, that this prosecutor <laughs> went you know, crazy. So um, I, I still sort of feel that the judges are in a pretty good position um, to sort of get a general sense and maybe better than, than somebody else. Um, I, I, I don't know how you implement the algorithm. Miriam Conrad told me about the other day, that's or before I wrote the letter um, to you. I think it's an interesting idea. I, I, don't, I didn't understand it as case specific, but more system specific. And um, it strikes me as a thoughtful way to I encompass the larger, if you could figure out the algorithm correctly in some way, and to give you a neutral principle. So I thought that's an interesting way to solve some of the problems. In terms of um, who decides, that's sort of what your question is, right? Um, I think that moving, to, you know, I, I agree with what Judge Torrance saying, that to the extent you have problems, that you should, part of what you should do is try to fix the problems rather than rework the system to solve a problem in a particular area, if that's what you have. Um, I do think people who have vouchers cut should receive notice of the basis and a chance to respond. Sometimes it might not look from the submission like there was a good reason to do that, and if someone was called out about it, they can submit a short explanation. We have a process that, it, that in our plan that that's what's supposed to happen. And somebody can submit something, and if they do, you can, you know, a judge can look at it and say, okay, well, now it makes sense, or no, it doesn't. So there ought to be that back and forth. Um, I do think that answering the re what's reasonable or what is the right standard to some extent is helped if it's done um, by um, 
people who are doing this all the time. So that's why I, I think, like, I just look at the defenders and say, I think uniform, at least I know in our district, but I think my sense of talking to other judges, people are uniformly happy with the quality of representation by the defenders, and they're making a lot of these decisions in individual cases, and it's not being made by judges, and it's working very well. We're having this discussion about the CJA. So it suggests to me we should look at that to try to figure out how to do that. The, the, the comparison uh, between what public defenders and CJA attorneys uh, have in terms of resources brings to mind uh, the striking disparity that we've uh, seen uh, in, in many districts, at least, between the use of experts between uh, public defenders and CJA lawyers. And I'm, I'm interested in your experiences. Uh, first, whether you've also found that same disparity exists. Uh, between the frequency of, of, of use of various experts, both investigators and, say, uh, uh, psychological experts or um, uh, other kinds of experts, uh, between uh, CJA lawyers and public defenders, and then also what you think the causes of that might be in terms of uh, why CJA lawyers are not having the investigators, not bringing them to bear, not using them as often, and if there's any change in the law or change in the standards that, that might equalize those? Well, to the extent that there is a difference, um, I think it, it may relate to the presumptive rates that the circuit has for investigators and experts. Um, it's almost impossible to find uh, certain experts at the rates that are listed in the, in the Second Circuit's plan. Um, so, you know, if I were a CJA attorney and I was trying to find an expert at, that I could pay at the rate that I'm allowed to pay, that's a problem. That's a pretty simple fix, I think. I, I, I don't, I think, um, uh, and maybe Leo could answer this question, the public council, uh, pu public defenders have experts that they can go to can sort of count on a modicum, a certain book of business with the public defenders. The individual CJA lawyer doesn't have that. So his ability to even bargain for these rates is limited. So that's another uh, issue. Uh, the rates have to be higher. I mean, I think that, as I've said in my testimony, I think the government pays double what the, what this, the lawyer, that what experts are on the CJA list, which is really an outrage. I don't see difference between um, CJA panels use of experts and federal defenders use of experts, and I haven't, you know, studied those numbers, so I couldn't say uh, exactly. But I, I haven't seen that uh, disparity. I know we're uh, this year, last year was 19 percent, um, so we're a little higher than the national average on use of experts. Um, we see a lot of uh, psych, psychologist experts in the sex offender cases at sentencings. Um, the Federal Defender's Office doesn't tend to, tend to do that as much, I don't think. Um, but so I guess I would say I'm not sure I see it in Maine the way you're seeing it in other places. I think there's a disparity, but I don't really know. I don't know the numbers. I, a few numbers just before I came on from Miriam Conrad. I think you should ask her when she's on tomorrow for our district because I think she's on top of the numbers to explain them to you better. I have a sense that it might be true. Um, there's a differential, but I'm not positive. Uh, I, if there is a difference, I think part of it is it, I bet the difference varies across, at least in our panel, across the panel. So there's, in 100 lawyers, there's a certain amount of variation, I suspect, in the sort of best third of the panel. They're using experts whenever it's necessary and appropriate in seeking at it, whereas maybe in a third of the panel that might be weaker um, or not as strong, um, it might be less. I don't know if that's cultural because they're not as familiar with it. They don't have people doing it all the time. They're not as from. They've done that many cases. They don't really know about the process of applying for the money. But um, uh, I think that might be the issue. Thank you. Mr. Khan. And into my, backs, the microphone, my back's getting to me at this point. Um, so uh, can I ask a quick question of you, Judge Pollack? You mentioned, and, and actually, I guess, also Judge Gertner and, and, and Judge Sorokin, because you, you all mentioned um, in your districts that the circuits have presumptive rates for experts that are unreasonable. 
And so my question to all of you would be, has there been any, any effort on the part of the districts to go to the circuit and say, you need to revise these rates that our lawyers cannot get the experts they need? Not that I know of. Uh, my understanding is that it's not set by the circuit. Um, I'm not aware of that. Maybe I'm, maybe it's one more thing I'm ignorant of. But my understanding of the way it works in our district is the state public defender has a list of approved rates that they pay. And those, I think, are incorporated in our CJ, a reference by our CJ plan as sort of presumptive rates. Those rates are particularly low. And, um, and I, I bet the, the difference from what the government pays that uh, Nancy's referring to and what um, uh, uh, being double is in reference to that. And so in answer to your question, yes, we are looking at, we have just begun the process of looking at like developing some sort of rates that on the one hand would be reasonable and would be enable people to get quality experts when they needed, needed them and competent people, um, but would be um, a wise use of the money. And we have literally just begun the conversations to talk about that. I don't think it's something we need permission from the circuit from, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. Okay, and I would, if it's, well. Microphone. Sorry. Let, let me turn to another area. When you started your testimony, Judge Sorokin, you, you mentioned that um, you think one of the things we really need to be focused on is quality, and, and I certainly agree with that sentiment. And one of the things as we talk through these problems, and again, I, I heard this as everybody was talking about what's in place, is that all the mechanisms that seem to be in place uh, have nothing to do with quality. They all have to do with cost savings. So we look at cutting vouchers, we look at denying or approving experts, uh, but there's almost nothing that either uh, it, you know, fosters or encourages quality representation. And you know, it's very easy in a defender office, I can do that. You know, so for instance, my supervisors review the files of my attorneys and look to see, did they exhaust these avenues? Did they, you know, how often do they meet with the client? What do they pursue? Can't do that when judges are, are involved in the process. So I'm, what I, my question to all of you is, can you envision alternative mechanisms that we could put in place while with, in, in the current system, judges in charge of things that would encourage, foster, incentivize quality representation? I think it would be a good thing. I would be in favor of it. If you said, how would you graft on the present structure doing that? I think from a judge's perspective, it's a little bit difficult because um, what you're, I think one way or another, you're involving exactly what you're describing is happening in your office. Somebody's, you know, you either have the lawyer reaching out, talking to people, and that's, you want to, you want to encourage that. So one way we can encourage that is we can pay for it when it's in the voucher. That would encourage it, um, talking to other lawyers. But the review that is the other way of uh, being undertaken. We're not really in the position to do. If it comes after the fact, it sort of creates a 2255. You'd rather have it, from my perspective, I'd rather have it before the fact because I'd rather have the person represented correctly the first time than have the problem the second time. And from the defendant's perspective, the standard is so much less favorable later that they're better off earlier. But that, I think that starts going down a road of having some sort of s different system than the judges in charge, I'm not sure. Uh, same question for yes. My only thought is that um, it, I think what is very effective in Maine is the fact that the federal defender is uh, completely available to the panel. So he, I talked to him before I, I came here and he said, every day I talk to someone on the panel um, who's asking a question and, and it's and it's that kind of a training component it's kind of like that voice down the hall that you that you value to as a sounding board um, and I think that that might that kind of a mechanism I'm not sure how you can uh, implement it in the bigger districts but it's that sort of tight um, con connection and communication between the federal defenders officer office and the panel attorneys um. I think that the first thing is that you have to share the emphasis on the guidelines in Massachusetts, and that's all that I know of, is almost 100% on cost containment. There is a few words about excellence, but the rest of it is all about cost containment. I think you have to change that emphasis. I also think there's a sort of, uh, uh, and I'm not in a position to totally evaluate it, it's almost as if there's a common law of voucher cutting. So when it gets around in the restaurant way, what people's 
vouchers were cut for, and that communicates uh, really don't do too much uh, uh, issue. Now, it may be wrong, because it may not cut across the district, but when that happens, it matters. And so to some degree, it may be a question of uh, trying to, uh, taking the authority for this, or at least taking um, the intermediate authority away from the judges so that there's some kind of expert group that the judge then gets a recommendation from might be helpful to deal with that problem of this common law of cutting. Um, I think that the other way that, the, that it sort of to deal with the, uh, although the, the CJA panel needs to be independent, I know that when I was on the bench, if there was a lawyer that was particularly terrible, um, we would just make a, you know, tell what we had seen in court. It was up to the panel to decide whether that person stayed on or off, but perhaps in the case of the battered women's syndrome case, I ought to have said to someone, I was concerned about this lawyer's representation of this woman. If, if, woman, if I'm the only one that had that problem, of course you won't take it into account. Uh, but it may be that sort of making it clear that you're policing the quality of the CJA panel and not just what they are billing is an important message. I would say that we have a, we have a great federal defender's um, office in our district, and, and I think David Patton is actually here in the back of the room. Um, and I know that they are always available to our CJA attorneys, and our CJA attorneys are a very tight-knit group, so they go to one another for advice. There's no way to supervise them on a ongoing day-to-day -day while they're on trial or, you know, preparing a case. Um, that would require a complete change in the system, it seems to me. Um, what we do do um, is we provide uh, training in, a, uh, in conjunction with the federal defenders. We have a very um, serious mentoring program that we try to use to train new lawyers. Um, and we have a system very similar to what um, Judge Gertner said, which is the judges are encouraged at the year-end time for review of the third of the panel to tell us what they think. And we get, you know, good reviews, bad reviews, and reviews during the year when something specific happens. So we take that into account. Um, it has nothing to do with how much they bill. I have no idea how much a, a particular panel attorney bills on a case-by-case -case basis. But I do know when I've got four judges calling me to say that they've gotten letters from clients complaining this, this lawyer doesn't visit them, um, the lawyer's never prepared for it. guilty pleas, this client doesn't seem to have a clue as to what's going on. Those are the kinds of information that we get um, that we can use to evaluate their, you know, their performance. But on a supervisory basis, such as the federal defenders provide for their attorneys, I, I don't have any idea how that would work. Is that something you've made known to the panel so that they understand, you know, one of the things we're looking at when we decide whether you stay on the panel is, you know, how often you're visiting your clients, are you ready for your pleas, those sorts of things. Do they understand that quality matrix as part of the? You know, I don't know. I think so. I think so, but I don't know. That's a very good question, and maybe it makes sense to be more upfront and tell them that, because that really is something that we take very seriously. Judge Gertner, I, I wanted to ask you one, one last question, and I'll turn no. over the mic, which is, you mentioned something that, that I've often talked about, which is that there are no, this is in your written testimony, that there, there are no more one-inch files, you know, and on the simple drug case, you've got three phone dumps, cell tower site data, poll cams, you know, and you know, God knows what else is, is you know, in, in your simple little drug case or gun case. And um, I, I guess the question I have for you, is that uh, realization something you came to while you were still on the bench, or is it only something you've really come to understand since you retired and are participating in the CJA panel? Well, 
Well, you saw some of it because the, case, the very few cases that went to trial usually had an enormous amount of resources in them. Um, but you know, the, the, so many of that is so much of that is buried in the plea. It's exactly facing that mountain of evidence that the person decides to plea. To some degree, I've heard more of it now, at where, and I think it's become much more substantial. Where, you know, the the defendant would get a file with you know gigabytes of material in it, and then rush to the judge for an expert to look at to help them search it. Uh, some mechanism for reviewing the, the, the files with the client in the prison, which is an incredibly difficult thing uh, to do. Um, so I've, it's, that's information I've learned about since from the complaints that I have heard. But it would make sense, because as I said, the parallel on the civil side is emails, e-discovery, et cetera. And you would have expected that to some degree, even in street cases, on the criminal side. Um, and we should be as concerned about the disproportion of resources in one as in the other. All right. Thanks. How about in the back? Any questions? None, 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 none. All right. Professor. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, as Professor Kerr mentioned, the committee has been quite interested in this uh, question of the use of service providers across the, the various districts. And I want to clarify that that these uh, percentages that we talk about, for example, your 19% in Maine, isn't just experts. That's paralegals and investigators and other experts. Um, but this is a question that comes up regularly at the hearings. And I'm wondering, Judge Gertner, if you could help me with something here. Uh, you kind of have the trifecta of uh, experience <laughs> of private practice, the bench, and now uh, the most uh, ivory of ivory towers. When I ask this question generally at the, uh, and it always comes at the end of the hearing, about the percentage of cases where a service provider is used, I oftentimes get one or two responses from attorneys. Um, I either get, you know, I like to do the investigation myself. Why should I be hiring an investigator to do it? Or the evidence in these cases is fairly clear. What am I going to need an expert for? The government's got my client on tape. There's not a whole lot else. I'm going to plead them out. You shouldn't be expecting me to be hiring a bunch of experts. In your experience, what percentage of cases would you expect if we're getting at least a Chevy, if not a Cadillac, a represent, representation, would you expect to see service providers used? What range should the committee be expecting? In my experience as a lawyer, my experience as a judge, or my experience as a professor? Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, Being the defendant's still there, but hopefully that won't come up. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't give you a particular percentage. Um, Can you give us a range? I, I, I really can't. I know that um, as a lawyer, um, and that may have been a little crazy, there were no easy cases. Uh, that is to say, I thought that it was important to have resources in every case, uh, whether it's sentencing resources or jury selection resources in every case. But I think that I, I mean, that was, I mean, I'm not sure that everyone is like that. Um, it's hard to say. You know, on the one hand, we encourage the government to bring big drug cases. So it's not, you know, the federal drug cases are not just the, shouldn't be the hand-to-hand -hand sales on the corner. But big drug cases also mean that there was an investigative file over a period of time. Um, it's very hard to know what a percentage would be because it does seem to me that there has to be some examination. Well, would there be, uh, all right, let's let you have your former judge hat on. Is there a level at which, if you looked at a district and saw the rate was below X, you would start wondering what's going on? I didn't, I, I wouldn't have seen it system-wide. I'd see it in a per case. So I would see, this is actually a retained counsel, I would see an arson case where no motions were filed before the trial began. And then the first witness was the dog handler whose testimony was, was laughable. <laughs> and I suspended the jury and turned to the lawyer, asked the jury to leave, and I turned to the lawyer and said, you're going to challenge this. Now, that was retained counsel. So um, I, I only know the merits. I can't give you the number. <coughs> Maybe others can. Well, I'm curious whether the rest of you have an opinion on this. 
Because that, that's one of the things the committee is struggling with. When you look at districts that have a rate of 50% and others at 2%, and we and the committee gets different answers from the lawyers around the country, how should the committee be interpreting that testimony? Can you get information about what the government is spending on these cases? Generally not. Yeah. I would be curious to know what percentage, I would have two thoughts. One is, I don't have a specific answer to you, except that it seems kind of low to be only one quarter or one or three percent of the cases in which you have a paralegal or an investigator or any sort of service provider. When you include investigators in it, it seems a, as a gut level, I go, hmm. But I would be curious about what's the, what, if it's, tra if the defenders know the answer for themselves, what the data is for them, because I think that'd be a good benchmark. And it would be somewhat district specific, because it might be, in, or time specific. You know, if you have a district where the, there may be a very high rate of 5Ks and the government may be more um, negotiable, then you might see different responses from the defense than compared to a district where, say, the government, this may not be happening presently, but at least was true in our district some number of years ago, where they said no plea negotiation whatsoever, maximum charge, seek the maximum, then you would expect the amount of investigation and the like to go up in that district. And so that would be my thought. Great idea. <laughs> I have no sense of a percentage. Uh, I do think the Federal Defenders probably does have that information. Um, I would say that the mix of cases in a district may also uh, impact that. So if you have a lot of cases, as we do, that are capital cases, terrorist cases, mega securities cases, I think you're going to see a higher percentage of uh, investigators, paralegals, associates being requested just because of the nature of the cases. So I'm not really sure that uh, across the board percentage would be possible. Well, I, I don't think I'm asking for a, a national standard. I, I'm asking for your learned uh, advice on how the committee should be seeing this. Moreover, how to interpret the responses of lawyers who say, you're asking me to do something that um, you shouldn't be asking me to do, which is to get an investigator or to, to get an expert. But I, I think we've probably exhausted this. So let me just go to a last question. That's uh, for you, Judge Pollack. You, uh, you mentioned your former colleague, uh, Judge Gleason, who uh, I think we've established is still with us, just not on the federal bench. Uh, but it reminded me that uh, he testified before the committee in Miami. Uh, and he gave some testimony, I just quickly found this, that uh, seems a little different than what you're saying about your panel, and I'm hoping you can help us understand how to interpret the different perspectives out of New York Eastern. So this is what he was saying with regard to the low hourly rate. Quote, that rate attracts the wrong people, the bottom feeders who can't get paid work. We should be raising the rates to get the right people. And he was referring to the Eastern District of New York when he said that. How should the committee be interpreting the differences between what you had to say and what he said? Uh, you know, I, I read that. Um, I strongly disagree with him. I um, think that we do not attract the bottom feeders. Um, are there some attorneys over the past 15 years who should not have been on the panel? Absolutely. And we have gotten them out over time. Um, I, I think what he was trying to say is that, you know, in New York, this is a really low hourly rate. It's less than half of what we give to low-level civil attorneys in, you know, ERISA default cases. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how else to say it. And um, it's, 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 from my perspective, a sin that these criminal defense attorneys who really do um, what is incredibly important work to keep our system going get paid at such a low rate. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not at, at this point sure what he meant, but I think he was trying to make a point. Um, and, I, and I don't think if he were here today, he would agree that the level of our panel attorneys are bottom feeders. So I, I have a follow-up question to his. Which, so why do they do it? Why would anybody who, who can't really 
afford to do these cases at that cost, why do they do it? I think they like the work, mm -hmm. and I think they are truly dedicated. That's what they are. And to the extent that there's been discussion about pro bono service, I mean, it really is pro bono in the sense of the rates they're getting paid are way below what they deserve to be paid. Um, but how can they afford, given these mega cases, gigabytes, et cetera, how can an attorney afford to do that and not his firm not suffer, his private practice not suffer? We are not talking about the old kind of cases that took you know, a week to look at. We're talking about cases going on for months and months and months. You've said you have terrorism cases, security fraud cases. That's not pro bono work, is it? No, it's not. Um, and we have actually called out separate panels for our capital cases and our terrorism cases, and these are attorneys who are willing to do it. Um, you know, there are attorneys who struggle. Um, particularly in the last year or so when the number of cases brought by our U.S. attorney has dropped dramatically. Um, and, you know, there was a discussion here about how many cases a year do you think, you know, a panel attorney should have. I mean, we've struggled with that because there has been such a drop in the number of cases filed and the number of cases that CJA attorneys get. Um, I can only hope and pray that you guys are going to raise the rates so that we can keep our panel at the we don't same have the money. quality. <laughs> but, you know. Thank you. thank you. All right. Well, on behalf of the entire committee, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Again, I know you've traveled from long distances. You've taken, you've had thoughtful comments, and we appreciate it. I want to encourage you, if you think, I mean, we've had some vigorous discussion here, as Judge Torreson said. Um, if you've thought of anything or think of anything that we didn't ask you, or that you'd like to add, please, please feel free to submit it or get in con contact with us because the more information we have, the better we like it in some ways. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of the entire thank committee. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.